Moving right along, um, we now have a presentation by Lawrence Brackmo. He is the father of the TCP Vegas congestion control algorithm, and more recently, he's been doing lots of interesting things with BPF at Facebook, including TCP BPF, and what he's talking about today, the host bandwidth manager. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about evaluation of host bandwidth manager. So last year, I talked about a network resource manager. So this is the same thing, except that we're not doing the evaluation based on the actual patches. Uh, and to recap, uh, what we had last year is an idea about how to do management uh, initially for C groups, for, for the bandwidth, both ingress and egress. And we created uh, some uh, test patches to evaluate the idea. Uh, when we submitted it later on, we realized that we needed to make quite a few changes. And we, at that time, we also changed the name to host bandwidth manager because we were just focusing at that time on the host bandwidth. You know, the concept of NRM was to manage bandwidth also at different areas of our network, but this is just about the host. So to recap, Host Bandwidth Manager is a BPF-based network uh, framework for managing egress and ingress bandwidth uh, at the host. It uses the ingress and egress C group SKB hooks. And you know, Linux already supports allocating and managing many system resources, such as CPU and memory, but I think uh, there's more to be done for bandwidth management. Uh, so that was the goal of this work. So in particular, so what are the differences from the previous stack? So first of all, there are some code changes. Uh, previously, we didn't have any spin locks for BPF, so we used a global lock to do it. So now we're, the, the code is implementing the spin locks. Uh, also, it turns out that initially we wanted to call from the BPF program, uh, make calls to affect the TCP socket. For example, tell it to enter congestion window reduction. Turns out that when we have the hooks, uh, Eric correctly pointed out, there are some code paths where do, do, we do not own the socket lock. So rather than calling, for example, enter CWR directly, what we did is the framework already supports for uh, the queues to be able to return congestion notification, right? So that TCP then can call itself enter CWR. And what we did is, uh, add support so that we can do the same thing from the BPF program. We can notify the TCP on the return path that there's congestion, and then uh, TCP itself will call TCP enter CWR. Also, we could not, we get into some issues at some times where we were trying to limit the egress bandwidth. Sometimes we had to drop packets, and if we drop all of the packets for a flow, we're gonna get a situation where we need to depend on the probe timer to start sending again. So this would introduce 40 millisecond delays at some stages. So what we do now is that we have access to the TCP socket state. We can figure out you know, if how many packets are out for this flow. And if, you know, if it's less than one, then we will not drop it just to prevent uh, forcing the call to a probe timer. Also, the evaluation is different. First of all, we're using the actual upstream patches as opposed to our experimental code. And we're also doing tests with multiple C groups instead of just one, which is you know, the ultimate goal of this work. Uh, and we also have some tests of using the ingress to prevent incas congestion, in losses due to incas congestion. Uh, and we also introduce support for using fair queuing, support for earlier departure time. So the idea is that you can write uh, a time into the SKB and the FQ will ensure that the packet does not is not sent before that time. And you can use that then to, to do shaping as opposed to just policing. So what other options are there to, to manage bandwidths? You know, obviously traffic control allows us to use queuing disciplines to shape uh, and police outgoing traffic. And typically HTV is what is used for this purpose. Uh, but one, one of the problems is that you're doing, trying to do it for a lot of things uh, you can have performance issues uh, due, due to the lack. And you know, we've used that in the past at Facebook and typically we'll end up with 
every now and then that, that, that there would be issues that we would need to solve related to using HTB for this purpose. Uh, there's also ways to use BPF to do similar things. For example, Google uses the hook at uh, CLS Act TC uh, in order to uh, manage a flat HTB for them to, to do for their uh, bandwidth manager. And one can use also FQ with EDT at, at different points, uh, different types of hooks for BPF to do it. So this is not the only solution to do for egress. So a quick overview of HBM. So the idea is that we, like I mentioned before, we use the existing ingress and egress C group SKB hooks. The policing and shaping is done through, by the BPF program through ECN marking, uh, return code to trigger TCP's congestion window reduction. Uh, we can also use early departure time uh, with FQ. And of course, you know, packet drops. For ingress policy, we are more limited of what we can do. We can only do ECN marking, or we can drop packets. That's, you know, we need to tell the sender to slow down. And unless we wanted to, to use another mechanism, those are the only two ways that, that we can do it. Um, the policy algorithm obviously is implemented in a BPF program. And it can also use the TCP state to improve that behavior. For example, looking at packets out, or looking at the RTT or, or the connection to make a different decision. Uh, in particular, you know, the, uh, the code that, that I used that is based on the code that was upstream with the HBM patches, it uses a virtual queue type behavior that includes the spin lock to protect access to this queue. It, use, it includes the, uh, uh, the last time that uh, a packet, you know, was trying to, uh, the, that was uh, egress came to our hook point. Uh, we keep uh, track of the credit in bytes. And then we also have a rate that, you know, that that's what we're trying to enforce. Uh, then when we send a packet, the first thing we do is we, the credit is increased by the last time, you know, the delay between the last time we want to send a packet and right now, that's time where we didn't send anything. So it comes as credit. And then uh, the credit that then will be reduced based on the length uh, the wire length of, of the SKB, right? So you have to possibly take, account, uh, take into account the multiple headers of a, a TSO packet, et cetera. And then we make a decision based on the credit and the packet info. When we're using EDT, it's a little bit different. The structure is the same, but all we use is the last, we don't use the credit, we use the last time. Because for, for EDT, we're keeping track of when should the next packet be sent for uh, this particular C group. And, uh, and that time between tends to be in the future if we are like behind. And the difference between that and, and the present is the, the credit in some ways, you know, how, how, how big our queue is. So we, we don't need to use the credit. So it's, it's a little bit simpler managing for that case. And uh, so the idea is that, you know, we have this virtual queue. And in this case, uh, I go negative. Uh, one could shift it to the right and it will be positive. But the idea is that if the credit is so low, you know, like we run below uh, and we hit the packet, it should be the packet, the drop threshold on the left as opposed to the small packet drop threshold. If we hit the drop threshold, we're going to drop the packet, right? And we're obviously we're trying to prevent that with when we use CCN marking and all that. Uh, we, are, we have a large packet threshold that is smaller and the idea is that we are willing to drive large packets sooner so that we have some buffer that we can use to give priority to smaller packets. And this, this helps to prevent, you know, like scene starvation and things like that. Uh, and then we have a marked threshold. If our credit is, you know, negative enough, we will do marking. Uh, and the marking, you know, in quotes, means different things based on what type of packet connection we have. So for example, if the packet supports CCN, we will mark it. If, it, if it's TCP and does not support ECN, what we'll do is uh, we're going to return congestion uh, to TCP, so they call CWR, based on a linear probability. So the bigger the queue is, the virtual queue is, the more likely 
that will mark congestion, right? So it's kind of like an implementation of, of uh, WRED uh, in our code. And of course, uh, if we were using EDT, this rather than them being credits, it would be uh, delays, and then we would use that time to, to timestamp that the packet, and also you know to, to do ECN marking and all that. So, but the behavior is quite similar in the code. Uh, so once again, this just rehashes what I'd say. Once we hit the marking threshold, uh, between that and the drop threshold, we have a linear probability of marking the packet with congestion so that uh, the sender will reduce, its, will reduce its congestion window and its rate. So evaluation. So for evaluation, uh, we did a couple of different things. Uh, we redid some of the C group egress uh, for a single C group that we did before because the code is actually different. So we wanted to, to see uh, what is the behavior. And then we also tested with multiple C groups to demonstrate how we can actually manage the bandwidth and what kind of behaviors we have when we're using all the different mechanisms, right? Like in some cases we use CDT, some of we use DCTCP, other times it's for flows that uh, to not support either one, so it's just dropping, and we wanted to see how we would perform in those cases. And uh, we did it for multiple C groups for egress, uh, so that we can divide the, the bandwidth, the egress bandwidth of the host. And finally, also we did it for uh, for ingress. And the test that I'm showing right now is for like a single C group, and it was just demonstrating how it can be used to prevent incas or decrease the probability of incas packet drops. Uh, so single group egress, right? So this is an example where we have a one gigabit per second limit, and the different things we tested were just cubic with a DCN. So all we can do is tell the sender to you know reduce the congestion window or drop the packet. We have cubic with EDT, so we can also do actually do some shaping. Uh, in addition, uh, we have DCTCP, so we can use ECN marking, and we have DCTCP also with EDT because. I wanted to see if there were any advantages of combining both of those together. Uh, so other than the cubic, you know, that achieves a little less than the limit, you know, like 900, I think 960 uh, megabits per second, all the other ones can reach the limit quite nicely of one gigabit per second. Uh, typically, in this experiment, what we're doing is multiple RPCs of 10 kilobytes and one megabyte. And the reason for me is that I always I'm very interested in how uh, elephant flows affect, you know, uh, my flows uh, and, and in their latency. So typically, all my experiments, I always do a combination of uh, large RPCs, small RPCs, and in some cases, also streaming. Uh, so in this case, we can see that uh, they all behave quite similarly, which in some ways is surprising that uh, just pure cubic, you know, with even condition notification, uh, we were doing quite well, which is uh, nice to see. Uh, of course, when we're just running Cubic with a DCN, we're dropping more packets than when we have ECN notification, but they were not too bad. This is 0.06% of the packets were being dropped. Uh, for Cubic and DCTCP, we had some drops, 0.01%, and in this case, it was due, in, typically due to it during the slow start. Uh, it takes for DCTCP, it takes a little bit too long to uh, for the sender to slow down, uh, and we have some packet losses due to that. When we combine DCTCP with EDT, we didn't see any packet losses, right? In particular, probably it's because our threshold, because their time, they turned out to be a little bit different than when we're using uh, the credit base as opposed to uh, delay base. Uh, and the the latencies are quite similar. Uh, the cubic itself did a little better because there are, the RTTs were a little smaller with the cubic. You know, it didn't reach the, the one gigabit per second. Uh, so there was less queuing due to that. So that 10 kilobyte RPC, which is the orange, uh, it's a little bit lower than for the other ones. Uh, but the cast is then than the one, one megabyte is larger latency uh, than the other ones. Uh, and in this case, I think we're seeing this is a, a 
a logarithm scale, so we're seeing some uh, RTOs um, and some delays of like 200 milliseconds for, for the cubic. I, so this one is now with the uh, 9 g limit, uh, trying to enforce a 9 gigabit per second limit. Once again, you know, uh, this TCP uh, data can all get pretty close to the 9 g limit. Uh, uh, and the throughputs are similar for all of them. Uh, but with most of these cases, we have to do with losses. It's easy to achieve the throughput. The impact many times based on the algorithm would be in the latencies. And this shows us the latencies uh, for those two. And, uh, you know, uh, once again, I think uh, DCTCP has the, the lower latencies, which is, like, I think, typical of DCTCP. And this, has, this is, again, a large scale. So the small differences between DCTCP and cubic, even though they look small there, you know, they are significant. And w another test I did is to uh, like to uh, to do a 200 megabit per second limit because th that that's a really big stress test for this experimental setup because the RTTs are so small that in order to enforce the 200 megabit per second limit, sometimes you know you need to have uh, the congestion window needs to be very 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 small, right? Sometimes less than one, depending how many flows you have, could easily be less than one packet per RTT, right? Uh, which obviously can introduce losses and, and other things. So f for this setup, typically ADT is very nice, right? Because you get to do actual shaping as opposed to just uh, policing. So you don't have to drop the package. You, you, you can ensure that you have a couple of packets for each flow to make sure you, you, you're not hit by uh, delayed acts in some cases or by, you know, uh, the probe timer that I mentioned earlier. Uh, yes, of course. Can you explain what's in this picture exactly? Yeah, so I'm doing multiple folds at the same time. And the, uh, we have the aggregate rates, and then we have the 10K and the one megabyte rates, right? So I'm measuring them individually just to see the whole behavior. So obviously, with just pure cubic, uh, I can, you know, I'm, I'm only doing like 160 megabits per second. I, can, I, I cannot get close enough to the 200 because I'm having to drop too many packets, and the CWR is very coarse, right? As opposed to DCTCP that, that can uh, reduce the congestion window more gracefully. Uh, with cubic, you know, it, it's a, a bigger reduction when I trigger it either through losses or through calling CWR. But did that answer your question or? No, well, that's okay. Thank okay. You. Um, and let's see, in the previous one, uh, so, th so these are the, the latencies uh, for the 10 kilobyte. And obviously the cubic has very large latencies. Uh, as, as opposed to the other ones because it has more drops. Um, and this is the one megabyte PC latency. And here, uh, this TCP was here with higher latencies. And one of the reasons is that I realized just today that uh, I mentioned before that we can look at the TCP state and we, we can look that if we only have like how many packets that we have to try to get better behavior, uh, but I'm not using it with DCTCP. Um, so that probably would have helped. But if we use DCTCP with ADT, a combination of both where we do shaping, but we use the DCTCP mechanism to reduce the congestion window more gracefully than just uh, cubic ECN, uh, we get the best latency. One question. Yes. In the previous slide, how can we change to 90% latency instead of 99%? I'm sorry. Oh, it's a typo, sorry. It should be 99%. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, it's a typo. Yes. When you're measuring RPCs, are you doing a whole new connection per RPC or you have an established one per RPC? I'm sorry. So you're going through a SYN, SYNAC, No, 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 no. RPC. so these are back-to-back uh, -back RPCs. Okay, so you have established connections yes, for Yes, I have established, so it starts and, and then it's just back-to-back. -back. Great, thank you. So it produces a lot more load into 
the network. Otherwise, I would need to I would need a lot more flows to to congest. Yeah. Okay. So the next test is to actually create, for example, one G two two limits, right? So where we have like a low priority C group that we're, we're going to impose a one gigabit per second limit, and then we have a high priority C group where we're, we're giving it nine gigabits per second of bandwidth, right? So so now we're, we're testing the framework. Uh, to see how it behaves. And for the uh, 1G limit, you know, the, uh, it reaches it. Uh, for the 9G, it, it falls a little bit behind. And uh, I'm not 100% sure why that is. It could be because my, when I do a marking, for example, for DCTCP, it may be too low. And we know for DCTCP, if the marking, you know, the buffer is too small for the thresholds, then you cannot fully utilize the link. Uh, so, yeah, and in particular, this was with only, uh, I believe it was with four flows in particular. So uh, I did some tests with more flows later on. I did not these slides, and I was able to get closer to the 9 gigabit per second by, having, by increasing the, the number of flows. Um, for this one, we were just looking at the uh, at the rates for all the different ones, and they all, you know, again behave more or less similarly. Uh, and to me, so, you know, and I say, I say once again, typically it's easier to achieve the rates that, that the bigger issues are, are the latencies, right? Uh, so if for the latencies we're looking at the 10k and the one megabyte for the two different uh, C groups. Uh, so one is for the one gigabit, two is for the 10 gigabit. And uh, we can see here that, um, you know, they're all more or less the same, but not exactly. This is, again, logarithm. And it seems that uh, DCTCP, again, seems to have the lower latencies for all of this. Uh, so uh, our preference, you know, is, is, has been to use DCTCP when doing this kind of work. Uh, so the, the next thing I'm gonna talk is about using the same mechanism for ingress uh, to also try to, to limit losses due to incast, right? So the experimental setup was to have four senders uh, that are sending to one receiver. And each sender is doing uh, three flows, one 10K back-to-back -back RPCs, one megabyte back-to-back -back RPCs, and eight megabyte to back RPCs. I want to do the megabyte, you know, to put more stress. Go ahead. My immediate gut instinct is that RSS is going to be saving your tailbone here. Receive side steering. What do you mean? Let's keep going. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, so the idea is that we apply the limit. So when, whenever we want to use the mechanism to prevent incas losses, we we apply the limit to the root C group, right? As opposed to, to the different C group. So it will apply to, to the aggregate uh, traffic coming in. Um, and we need to put a limit below the bandwidth of the link. Uh, first of all, you know, we need to go ab above it so that we, we, we start uh, running out of credits. Secondly, also is because uh, the gizmos has some head, headroom, right? If I impose a limit, let's say that I have a 10G link, I impose a limit at 9G, but I, I will not drop the packets, right? It's just for marking and to notify the sender to slow down. If I impose the limit at 9G, it means I have a lot more headroom to deal uh, with bursts before that switch above me needs to drop them. So I can use the buffers in the switch above me to do the drops, and I can also use the extra bandwidth that the 1G in this case where you know, I can go over and uh, uh, give me some time to react before packets are dropped. Okay. So what we did is we imposed a nine gigabit per second limit. And the baseline is we're not doing anything. We're just sending to the receiver. We, we're not imposing any limits, right? Uh, on the next one, we do in cubic, cubic ECN, and DCTCP to do limits. Uh, 
to try to prevent losses. So obviously, you know, like because we're trying to impose a, a NG limit. But by the way, these are the throughputs uh, for the different flows, right? So this is not the aggregate bandwidth, right? And yeah, the basement has higher for one megabyte and a megabyte, but it has a lot smaller for, for the 10 kilobyte, as you can see. And I will talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Do you have any questions? This slide doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what I'm printing here is the average bandwidth for the one 10, 10, 10K RPC, the one megabyte, and the eight megabyte, right? And we wanted to see how that is different. So, so we, you can see that whenever we're using uh, HBM, we, the smaller transfer, the 10 kilobyte, gets a lot more bandwidth, right? So it's more fair across transfer sizes, right? Okay. Uh, th that's the main uh, message of this slide. Uh, so now let's look at the 99% latencies, right? So, uh, so that's the baseline, this is TCP, cubic ECN. Um, so the issue here is that obviously, because the uh, 10 kilobyte gets a bigger rate, its latency is much smaller. Uh, the, with this TCP, the latency is also smaller for the 8 megabyte and the, and the 1 megabyte RPCs. Uh, the cubic ECN, it's not as, you know, it's worse, and also for, for the cubic, you know. And this effect The cubic is, is just wrapping, so it's like a horrible thing to do, right? So this effect is because DCC TCP is more graceful back off. Yes, so cubic ECN is losing some bandwidth in, in some ways, right. and, and, uh, uh, and it is also, yeah, and the DCC TCP can fully utilize more of the bandwidth there. For the baseline, that congestion control protocol is that running? Cubic. So, oh, for the baseline, it's just cubic. Cubic with no HBM, right? I'm sorry? Cubic with no HBM. Correct, cubic with no HBM, that's the baseline. Uh -huh, correct. Okay. Now, we cannot see very much between the 10 kilobyte RPC differences. So, in the next slide, I show it on its own scale, right? And uh, this is TCP, the, uh, it's six times lower than for baseline, right? So one of the advantages of this mechanism, once again, is to get fairness for smaller transfers, right? Which typically tend to suffer all, 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 the, all the time in uh, data centers. Uh, this last slide shows the retransmissions. So cubic ECN and DCTCP had zero retransmissions. And obviously that also affects the, the latencies. Cubic has horrible because the only thing we can do is drop. I mean, I'm just showing it there like uh, for completeness, not for, I would not recommend anybody, anybody one using that, obviously. It's not a same thing to do. Uh, if you're gonna drop, you may as well drop when the buffers in the switch get full as opposed to do it ahead of time. Uh, that's it. So the idea is that we can allocate bandwidth between C groups. And we can divide it effectively. We can we utilize uh, the, the bandwidth we have allocated. And we can also achieve fairness between uh, uh, different transfer sizes. And uh, we can also use it for ingress limiting to try to reduce the likelihood of losses and effect on latency for ingress congestion. Okay. Any questions? So you're doing ingress limiting primarily on the hosts. Yes. You're not engaging uh, ECN on the switches at all. No. no. So okay. the idea is that there are some environments where you cannot do that. Also, there are environments where you have like multi-host sneaks so that the switch may have support, but maybe the multi-host sneak does not have support for ECN marking. And this way is one way to achieve that behavior, right? At the cost of some bandwidth losses, right? Be because you have to use less than, than, less than the other bandwidth. Less bandwidth with one-sixth the latency is, is kind of nice sometimes. Yes. Uh, the related question was, um, and I mentioned it earlier in your talk, to me, receive side steering yes. uh, would have taken care of some of your 
issues with having small RPCs versus large RPCs. So are you feeding us through a single queue? All these RPCs are go going through a single queue at this level? So this was going into a single queue on the switch, yes. Well, okay, but on, on the policer side, on the ingress side, ideally you could have as many uh, queues as you wanted coming in. Are you just talking about the receiving cost? Yeah, the one that's trying to do ingress. I think the delays are not due on the receiving side, they're actually due on queuing elsewhere in, in the network. Okay, I'd love to talk to you later. Thank okay. you. Now uh -oh. I'm confused. I thought yes. you were doing the ingress stuff in the host itself, on the receiver. It is in the host. Totally. Okay. Uh, so, because you mentioned that uh, HDB had a big cost of a, because of a single spin lock, but then... No, no, uh, no, no, that, that, that's... That's what uh, on ingress. Yeah. But now on ingress, you add uh, some, some stuff with a central rate limiter while you probably have multi-queue uh, device, right? The 10 gig uh, device you are using are probably used with a multi-queue. With no? a what, I'm sorry? Multi multiple queues. Uh, yes. So you still need a spin lock to protect this central red limiter for the ingress. So is no, the, no, 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 so we're is using the spin lock on both ingress and egress. Yeah, so you have a centralized locking regimen for the C group BPF program that's doing all this yes, logic. Yes, correct, correct. So that kind of fights against the RSS-ness. Yes. I, that, I, that's I mean, point. That, that's, that's, a good point. that's probably have a heavy cost. Do you have an idea of uh, what this heavy cost has? Uh, what effect has this heavy cost on all this, your measurement? Because you don't really uh, show what the CPU cost of all this stuff. Uh, no, I don't have the numbers with me right now. Yeah, you did, should definitely run perf top while one of your tests is running and see if it shows up. That would be interesting. Very I usually interesting. collect the stuff. I just didn't have time to, uh, because I had to rerun some tests first. Okay, it's definitely something to look into. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Lawrence. Okay, thank you.